When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasuring to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Genesis 3, 6. From the beginning of the Bible, from the moment the first woman in humanity, Eve, takes the forbidden fruit, women have often been portrayed in a negative light. The story of Eve gets magnified into an anti-female tract. Is getting wisdom, is getting what Eve gave us, knowledge of good and evil, is that good or is that bad? Eve is not the only woman in the Bible whose reputation has suffered through the ages. Other women in scripture have also fared poorly. Was Jezebel really a wicked woman? Or was she just misunderstood? There's just nothing good said about Jezebel um, in the Bible. And what of Delilah? Is she to blame for Samson's downfall? Or Salome, whose famous dance resulted in the beheading of John the Baptist? Are these women actual historical characters or legends meant to teach a lesson? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. Sarah, Ruth, Deborah, Esther. Many women in the Bible have inspired us as heroines and leaders, but of the 1,426 names in the Hebrew Bible, only 111 are those of women. The New Testament offers but a few more. Most of these women are presented as virtuous, loving mothers, dutiful wives. But there are other women in the Bible, the seducers, temptresses, and usurpers of power, scarlet women. And it is these that capture our imagination. Their names are legendary. Jezebel, Salome, Delilah. It is in quest of understanding them that takes us back to the beginning of time to the biblical story of creation. We are in the Garden of Eden, and Adam has just been created. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. Genesis 2, 7. For centuries, theologians have used this biblical story, this creation of Eve, to prove that man is superior to woman. In fact, the Apostle Paul uses this exact reasoning. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. 1 Timothy 2.9 but some scholars have an entirely different view of the Bible's telling of creation. For then, women are seen as the fountainhead. How does creation go? It starts with the grass and the trees and the creepy crawlers, the, um, then the mammals, then the men, then the woman. 
See, if it goes from lower to higher, she's not simply a derivative, but she becomes the climax of creation. The Bible tells that God gave Adam and Eve one and only one restriction in the Garden of Eden. They were not to eat the fruit of a certain tree. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis 2, 16. It is now that one of the most powerful images in all the Bible is introduced. A naked and innocent but curious Eve is confronted by a serpent. The serpent tempts Eve with the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge, whereupon Eve responds that she and Adam will die if they eat of the fruit. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 4. Eve takes fruit for herself, then gives to Adam. Eve decided that it was more important to her to know all sorts of things than it was to follow this particular command of God. She makes that decision based on what she understands about the world out there. Having lived unclothed and innocent in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are now suddenly aware of their nakedness. They are reduced to hiding from God out of embarrassment, out of fear. Now, it's very common to say Eve took the apple, and so she's to blame. It's not so common to ask, and where was Adam? I could say Adam sits there like a dummy and doesn't know what to do. He makes no word, no protest, takes the fruit, eats it. What you have is a woman who's kind of thinking rationally about a situation, um, taking action on it, and the result of her action is that we humans now know good from evil. If Eve didn't do what she did, we would not be fully human, as we think of human in the most positive sense. The woman's role is essential. I see her as a culture bringer and a heroine. Adam, he's almost baby-like in this story and sort of pathetic. And I know the later tradition tries to get him off. Oh, Eve is a seductress and she's a temptress and all of this stuff. She just gives to him and he eats. The word sin isn't even used in the story. Was Eve the world's first sinner? Or was she the bringer of knowledge? More than 1,000 years after the Old Testament was first written down, Eve's character was firmly set in place by the writers of the New Testament. How do we understand the difference between the biblical Eve in the book of Genesis and later remembrances of Genesis? Uh, already at the time of the New Testament, she's recast as the one who brought sin into the world. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. 1 Timothy 2, 9. This later view of Eve has a much harsher opinion of the first woman in creation. How did such an interpretation come about? Paul and a whole tradition of Western commentators have set the story up as a model of how the relationship ships should be between men and women. Fundamentally, men should be in charge and women should be subordinate. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Genesis 3, 16. Many centuries later, this would be interpreted as the punishment God gave to Eve, that man shall rule over woman. I think under the influence of a strong bias against women, particularly in Christianity and in the leadership of Christianity, then the story of Eve gets magnified into an anti-female tract and gets used in that way, and that's a very unfortunate legacy. If Eve would later be interpreted as a sinner, 
Is it possible that she set the tone for how women would be regarded in the future? Another well-known woman of the Bible, the infamous Delilah, may shed some light. Was she the cunning seductress of Samson portrayed in the Old Testament? Or was Samson an active participant in his own downfall? Seduction, treachery, and shattered dreams. When we return on Mysteries of the Bible. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Judges 16, 19. It has been told and retold, the story of the Hebrew strong man, of the seductress who cuts his hair and robs him of his power, Samson and Delilah. Yet this story's message is disputed until this day. He fell in love with a woman in the Valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Judges 16.4 From the beginning, Delilah has a reputation as Samson's fatal attraction. She has been seen as a seductress from another culture. But does she deserve this reputation? In the 11th century before the Common Era, the biggest threat to the Israelites is the Philistines, who are well organized and more advanced, both militarily and culturally. During this period, there is no central government in Israel, and anarchy often prevails. Frequent border clashes take their toll on the Israelites, who long for a deliverer. The Bible tells us Samson's birth is a miracle. His mother is sterile. And so she would remain until the angel of the Lord appears before her. You are going to conceive and have a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Judges 13.3. By the time Samson would meet Delilah, he already is a thorn in the side of the Philistines. Not only has he torn apart the jaws of a lion with his bare hands, but according to the Bible, he has killed 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. He is not, however, an entirely heroic figure. For one can see, miraculously, he has lived the life of robust pleasures. Samson, although he is called by the Spirit of God to be a warrior, Samson doesn't rally large groups of people. Samson goes out and does it himself with these incredible feats of singular human strength. As a matter of fact, the strength motif of Samson is so strong that some scholars have suspected that perhaps there's been some influence from the Greek stories of Hercules. The Bible tells us that Delilah is not the first woman in Samson's life. Yet it is she who is most intricately linked with his destiny, and thus stands as a symbol of female treachery down through the ages. But does she really deserve this reputation? Is Delilah a seductress? No, she's not. She's fairly direct with him. She doesn't lure him. He wants her and she's um, willing to cooperate with the powers that be for a price. Uh, it's very different from someone who lures a man in and then um, seduces him. He seduces himself. He, Samson does not need to be seduced. He does all the work himself. He just looks for it and finds it and falls right into it He's with eyes wide open open heart, that's how he does things, and he does it again and again, and it gets him into trouble. Once the Philistines learned that their arch enemy Samson had fallen in love with Delilah, their chiefs approach her. 
They each offer to pay her 1,100 silver shekels if she will persuade Samson to tell her the secret of his great strength. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strengths and how you can be tied up and subdued. Judges 16, 6. She asks him for the source of his power and he lies to her. He tells her it has to do with the kinds of cords that he's bound with. When he falls asleep, she ties him up. With men hidden in the room, she called to him. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Judges 16, 9. Samson jumps up and snaps the cords with ease. Obviously, he lied to her. And so she asks him again. And again, he lies to her. And he does it three times. You would think he learned after two or three times what, the, what is happening, but he doesn't. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? Judges 16, 15. Half of the things Samson does, I don't understand. He does not seem to me to be a, a very rational person who thinks things out very well. I, uh, he's sort of the classic big lug, you know, who can, can lift a lot of weight and, uh, and isn't all that smart. If my head were shaved, my strengths would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. Judges 16, 17. When Samson is asleep with his head in her lap, Delilah has his hair cut off. Samson awakens to the realization that the power of the Lord has left him. He is captured by the Philistines who gouge out his eyes. Then he is taken to Gaza where he is put to endless work turning a millstone bound in shackles. But Samson's hair begins to grow back an occurrence the Philistines overlook. At a Philistine celebration at the temple of the god Dagon, Samson is taken out as a display to be ridiculed. Having planned his revenge beforehand, Samson stands between two pillars which support the temple. He braces his outstretched arms against them and prays to the Lord. Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Judges 16, 29. And so Samson dies, taking his enemies with him. But what of Delilah? What of her reputation as the temptress, as the seductress? Was she a true historical figure of flesh and blood, or merely a legend meant to teach us a lesson? One might ask whether archaeology provides any kind of actual historical and cultural context for a larger-than-life story like the story of Samson and Delilah. I think it does. For one thing, the topographic references in the story are accurate. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. Judges 14.5. If we could identify uh, Delilah with the site of Timna, uh, which is uh, modern Telbatash, that site has been excavated, and there have been found private houses there, uh, Philistine pottery and other um, elements that make this a typical Philistine site. So it's quite believable to see Delilah uh, as a resident in a town like that, not very far away from an Israelite town where uh, Samson lived. While the famous Temple of Dagon, where Samson brought the Philistines to their terrible end, is said to be buried somewhere in Gaza, archaeologists have found a similar Philistine temple at a place called Tel Kassil, on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. That's a much smaller temple, though it does have a column or two, uh, and it belongs in general to the period of Samson. We do know something about Philistine temples and what they looked like, and they are different from the uh, typical Canaanite or Phoenician or Israelite temples of the same period. 
A cylindrical pottery incense stand found at this site raises some intriguing questions. It depicts a figure of a man with arms clearly braced against two pillars. Is this an echo of Samson? A confirmation of the story? Archaeology may help to confirm the physical details in the Bible, but it cannot always shed light on its famous figures. For the time being, Delilah and Samson and their intriguing relationship remain a mystery. Even though her reputation as a scarlet woman lingers. Jezebel's body will be like refuse on the ground in the plot at Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, this is Jezebel. 2 Kings 9.37 What on earth did Jezebel do to deserve this terrible fate? What were the deeds that earned her a reputation as one of the Bible's scarlet women? Jezebel represents the import of alien worship into Israel. Did the Israelites worship foreign gods? They did. If they didn't worship foreign gods, the prophets wouldn't always yell at them to stop worshiping foreign gods. In essence, Jezebel, a foreign woman marrying into a Hebrew royal family, bringing her pagan gods with her, created one of the greatest religious conflicts in the Old Testament. The story of Jezebel and, and her husband, King Ahab, takes place in, in the ninth century in the northern kingdom uh, in Israel. At this point, the united monarchy that existed for the first three kings, for Saul, for David, and for Solomon, has split up, and the north has gone its own way. Going its own way, the northern kingdom of Israel sets up its own capital in Samaria. The Israelite king Ahab marries a foreign woman, a Phoenician princess named Jezebel, in order to make a political alliance. During the, this time of, of Jezebel and Ahab, uh, the northern and the southern kingdom, or Israel and Judah, were in kind of sporadic conflict with each other. The worship life of the people at this time was apparently mixed. The archaeological evidence is very clear that from the earliest time onward, uh, many Israelites worshipped Ael, the old Canaanite male deity, and also Asherah, the mother goddess of ancient Canaan. Thus, at the heart of Jezebel's story lies this question. As a foreign-born Israelite queen, how much responsibility should Jezebel bear for the Israelites' worship of foreign gods? The Bible tells the story in such a way that we are to condemn Jezebel for her zeal for her religion. She tries very hard to establish um, uh, serious cults of Baal and Asherah. And it happens, so happens that it's not the national religion of the country she is married into. And that puts her into conflict, of course, with the people who are zealous for the national religion of Israel. Jezebel's main adversary is the Hebrew prophet Elijah. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. 1 Kings 18.21 On Mount Carmel, Elijah challenges all the priests from Jezebel's court to a tournament of miracles. Elijah triumphs and has all of Jezebel's priests slain. Furious, Jezebel orders Elijah put to death. Elijah manages to escape into the desert. The saga of Jezebel takes a dramatic turn. The main story in the Bible that talks about Jezebel to the point where we really can know something about her character is the story of Naboth's vineyard. Naboth 
had a vineyard next to the king of Israel's. Ahab wanted the vineyard as an extension of his property and offered him money for it or, or a swap. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. 1 Kings 21, 29. Ahab sulked about this. And Jezebel asking what was wrong, he said, Naboth won't give me the vineyard. Doesn't mention anything about the inheritance. Jezebel, a princess, used to royal, absolute royal power, um, clearly thought this was insubordination. So Jezebel writes a letter in Ahab's name, which falsely accuses Naboth of blasphemy. As a result, Naboth and his entire family are stoned to death. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. 1 Kings 21, 15. I would call Jezebel a scarlet woman. Here is a wicked woman who got what was coming to her. After all, she married, she is the queen of Ahab, and Ahab is under a different set of rules that she doesn't seem to, to understand, you know, uh, or attempt to understand. And uh, it's all well and good to say, if you're the king, you can make up your own rules, but to go kill an innocent man and take his property is, is a bad thing to do. Were Jezebel's actions any different from the men in power of her day? Does she deserve her poor reputation? There's blood on her hands. She's scarlet from that. Uh, she brought death upon an innocent man in order to get something for her husband. She's also a powerful queen with a different tradition, who is loyal to her tradition. She did her job. Her job was to, to be a queen, to represent her nation. And she did that with pride and with courage. And when it proved to be the wrong thing in her host country, she faced the consequences. As for other events of Ahab's reign, including all he did, the palace he built was inlaid with ivory. 1 Kings 22, 39. Jezebel's husband, King Ahab, was known for building palaces with lavish decorations. His own palace at Samaria was named the Ivory House for all the intricate inlay and carvings. We do know something about the lives of kings and queens and the nobility at that time. We know one thing from the Bible about ivory palaces, for example, uh, that this dynasty indulged in. We have remnants from Samaria and from that region. Even today, one can visit the site and see the well-preserved style of masonry. Surely these are royal buildings. There is no question, I think, that what you see today is a part of Ahab's palace. So it seems perfectly possible that Jezebel and Ahab did exist. If so, what can be learned from her final days? For it is Jezebel's death, the final confrontation between herself and the Israelites, that has left an indelible imprint of Jezebel as a woman of evil. It is perhaps deserved, perhaps not. There was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. 1 Kings 21, 25. Elijah appears before Ahab, having learned of the death of Naboth, the man who is killed through the manipulations of Jezebel. Elijah prophesies that Ahab and all his descendants will be destroyed. 
And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord said, Dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. 1 Kings 21, 23. Jezebel's greatest moment in history, it has to do with the way she faces her death. She knows that her entire family has been destroyed. The house of Ahab has been demolished by Yehu, or Jehu, uh, a general who has been commissioned by a priest to precisely do that. And now he's coming towards her palace in the Valley of Jezreel, and she waits for him. She waits for him by putting on her makeup, by fixing up with her hair, and by sitting at the window royally, not afraid, but rather very proud as a queen. She literally faces him. When Jehu arrives, Jezebel does not ask for mercy. Rather, from her window, perched above, she contemptuously calls Jehu the name of a traitor. He looked up at the window and called out, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. 2 Kings 9.32 Named The Woman in the Window, this work from the 9th century before the Common Era was a popular Phoenician ivory motif, often found at ancient sites in the Middle East. Among the uh, ivory, little pieces of ivory carving, uh, th there is one that shows a woman looking out the lattice uh, of, of a window. And uh, you can't help but think when you see that of the, of the story of Jezebel looking out of the window, all of her makeup on, uh, and uh, seeing essentially her assassins on their way. Another find from ancient Samaria, which seems to echo the account of Jezebel's final moments, is a small limestone pallet used for mixing cosmetics. According to the biblical story, when Jezebel heard that Jehu was coming, she fixed her hair and she painted her eyes. And she may have used one of these little cosmetic palettes to mix the black eye shadow that was much favored in antiquity. Additionally, a semi-precious stone that was once set in a gold ring bears the name Jezebel. The seal can very well date back to the 9th century BCE and might be thought of as a ring belonging to Jezebel herself. The name Jezebel is a rare name. It never occurs anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible, and it doesn't occur anywhere in our Phoenician sources as well. So to find a ring with the name Jezebel on it, perhaps is to be connected with the stories in the Bible. Perhaps there is a reason the name Jezebel never appears again. It's interesting to me that Jezebel is a sort of term, a word for a certain kind of woman. It's the kind of woman who gets out of her place, has too much influence over her husband, who is too aggressive, uh, who is too scheming, and all those kinds of things. Her story is a nice one for people who don't like women that they think have gotten out of their place. And so it is that as Elijah prophesied, Jezebel's body is eaten away by dogs. Only her feet, her skull, and the palms of her hands remain. The image of Jezebel's death continues to intrigue us. It would seem a fitting end for one of the Bible's most hated women. Yet, there is another reviled female figure which begs investigation. A woman whose allegedly erotic dance would lead to the beheading of one of the Bible's most revered characters. When we return, the dance of Salome and the beheading of John the Baptist. Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. 
His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl, who carried it to her mother. Matthew 14, 8. With these words, the New Testament gives us the essence of the famous story of the Dance of Salome and the beheading of John the Baptist. It has been the subject of operas, poetry, and paintings. According to the Bible, this dramatic tale takes place during the time of Jesus in 30 CE. Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, is ruler of Galilee and also of Perea, a district east of the Jordan River, where John the Baptist was living at the time. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Matthew 11, 11. Herod Antipas divorces his wife and marries Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. In fact, Herodias is also Antipas's niece. Salome is the daughter of Herodias by her first marriage. The story of Herodias and Salome and Herod Antipas is a very complicated story of a family with all sorts of what we might call incestuous connection where brothers and half-brothers and sisters have uh, marry and unmarry in, in the struggle for power and wealth. John the Baptist denounces the incestuous marriage and does it to Herod's face. Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. Mark 6, 19. Herod is afraid to kill the popular prophet, but not afraid to silence him. John is arrested and imprisoned in the remote fortress of Machaerus on the cliffs above the Dead Sea. This is the fortress palace of Machaerus. It is located some 3,600 feet above the Dead Sea and some 15 miles southeast of the mouth of the Jordan River. Here it is believed is where Salome danced for Herod Antipas. Experts have been able to date the ruins to the time of Salome and Herod Antipas from the pottery shards and the style of architecture. Machaerus was originally built by Herod the Great because of its strategic location. It is at this point, as John the Baptist languished in his prison cell, that this biblical story takes a deadly turn. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for the high officials and military commanders. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. Mark 6, 21. Herod is so pleased with Salome's dance, he promises her whatever she wants and does so with a solemn oath. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. Mark 6, 24. You can imagine the shock of Herod Antipas, who did not intend to kill a prophet. He doesn't want to go down in history as being a Jewish king who killed a prophet. But he couldn't do anything about it because he'd said this in front of his friends. And, you know, he has to hold up his male ego at that point. John the Baptist's head is brought in on a platter and presented to Salome, who gives it to her mother. Strangely, Salome's name never appears in the Bible. There she is referred to only as the daughter of Herodias. The only reason her name is known is the writings of the famous Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. Herodias was married to Herod Philip, the son of Herod the Great, and had a daughter, Salome. After this, Herodias took it upon herself to go against the laws of the country 
and divorce herself from her husband while he was alive and marry her husband's brother, Herod Antipas. Josephus, the Book of Antiquities, 18.5. I think that uh, the name is not mentioned, Salome, in the Gospel, simply because it's not crucial to the point the Gospel writers want to make. The, the, the villainous is Herodias, and so they, they mention her name. Uh, but they let uh, the young girl sort of off the hook. Whether Herodias, Salome, or Herod Antipas was responsible for the death of John the Baptist is a matter of interpretation. It all depends on how one views the story. It's a very gruesome story. But who is the culprit? Is this Salome? Is it Herodias, or is it Herod himself? who wanted this man killed and didn't have the guts to do that. It's some sort of sexual abuse in the sense that she forces her daughter to go do a dance for her stepfather uh, here at Antipas, which is a very provocative, erotic kind of dance and is a sort of come on. A real image of Salome exists today thanks to her husband, Aristobulus. Aristobulus minted a coin, and on one side he put his own picture, and on the back of the coin he put Salome. And it says in Greek on the coin, Basileia, queen, and then her name. So, so we know who it was, it's very, it's very clear. So we have a nice picture of her. It's not some sort of ancient uh, legend. These are real people. Real people who perhaps danced on real floors. The Franciscan monks who excavated Macarus discovered a dining room with a mosaic floor. This may have been the actual floor upon which Salome danced. Salome has captivated the imagination and art and music and, and literature. Salome with the sexy veils, and none of that is in the Bible, but it makes a wonderful story. She did dance. All dances are not necessarily erotic. It's something that men and women did in antiquity. She is remembered, along with her mother, as the scheming seductress, which is not in the story. It's a case of a woman taking the blame, and of course then she is billed as the Scarlet Woman. Salome. Jezebel, Delilah, and Eve. Are they the deceivers, or are the interpreters themselves the deceivers? Did they do all of these really dreadful things, or were they, in fact, resented because they were women with power? Did these so-called scarlet women of the Bible truly exist as it is told, or were they tainted by the prevailing attitudes toward women at the time? What we do know is that these women share something in common. The fact that they are all colorful, vivid, and continue to ignite the imagination. At the end, we are back at the beginning. Had Adam taken the fruit and not Eve, would women have been portrayed differently. When the woman saw the fruit was good, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. Genesis 3, 6. This 